We're seeing a radical collapse of Christian culture in the world today. Humanity is losing its bearings, its direction, because it's walking in the dark. A lot of people aren't seeking God sincerely. God wants to give a gift to the human race through Jesus. In Him there is no darkness. In God alone is light. In God alone is life. He wants to live His life in you and through you and extend it to the whole world. To be Christian means to live by the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. That's what Christianity is all about, is saving people. Jesus is inside knocking on the door. He wants to come out. He's alive. He continues to save. The kingdom of God is at hand because the king is on the throne. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. I'm really looking forward to uh, talking with today's guests. We have Father Matt Williams. Welcome, Father Matt. Thank you. It's great to be here. And Stephen Colella. Welcome, Thank Stephen. You. Thank you. And they're both in the Office of New Evangelization for Youth and Young Adults, which, of course, is so important right now in the church today in the Archdiocese of Boston. And that, that's, that's also a, a challenging environment today. But before we start talking about your work, just tell us a little about your own personal journey. Like Maybe, Father Matt, would you start? Sure. Um, my name is Father Matt Williams, and I am from Braintree, Massachusetts, which is about a half hour south of Boston. I've been a priest for nine years, a little over nine years, and uh, went to uh, Catholic education my entire life. But it wasn't until a pilgrimage to a, a Marian shrine that I had a powerful encounter with the Lord. And I guess you could say it was in re recognizing that God is just not off in a distance, like that Bette Midler song, from a distance, God is watching us, but recognizing that <laughs> God is very personal, that he's incarnate in the person of his son Jesus and desires a personal friendship. And it was all through the, the maternal care and mediation of Our Lady, her presence, like being attracted to her, her love and her beauty and uh, her closeness to us and how she desires nothing but us to know her son Jesus. And through that recognition of, of God's personal unique love for me came this understanding that he has unique plans for me as well. And then over the course of a, a few years of, of discernment going back and forth, I jumped into the seminary in uh, 1997, St. John's Seminary in, in Boston, Massachusetts. And I could say that the, the moment that I, I stepped foot, I knew that this is exactly what I needed to do and this is who God was calling me to be. And when you know you're where you're supposed to be in God's plan as best as you can discern, sure. there's no greater peace, joy, and happiness. Yeah. And got ordained in 2003 served in a parish, and then from there for four and a half years, and then with the office. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you've had to live through one of the most difficult upheavals in the life of the Catholic Church, you know, in, in the Archdiocese of Boston. How, how did you get all through all that? You know, all the clergy sex abuse stuff and all the demonstrations and media. And it was awful. It was awful. One day at a time. We were in third theology when that happened, 2002. And... None of us left from my class. We were all went on to be ordained isn't, priests. Isn't that fantastic? It's, yeah, it's, and, and I think it's also a testimony to the authenticity of the vocations yeah. of the men that were, were yeah. that were ordained. And I remember a, a quote that sustained me by one of my uh, dear priest friends who would share this when we were in the seminary. He said, "You know that we know that one of the analogies is a church is a ship. You know and." Uh, in the year of faith, too, that, that's in the, the logo. We see the church, the ship of the church. And, you know, the, sh the, the, the ship of the church, you know, flows through the, the seas. And we know sometimes that the seas can become quite turbulent. And we are, we and back in 2002, we were in one of those turbulent times. And he says, but you know what God does? He raises up new kinds of anchors to steady the ship in the midst of the storm. And he says, he basically shared, he says, you're called to become a saint to help steady the ship and be part of the renewal. And so that just sustained me that in this moment, even though this is the most difficult times, God's grace is abundant and that he's calling us all to be saints. And the remedy is not to run away, but rather to embrace your full identity in Christ and become the person he's created you to be. Great. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Hey, Stephen, tell us a little about your own story. Uh, I'm a little different than uh, Father Matt. We say we have a good complementarity uh, between us. Um, Raised Catholic, uh, and uh, but never went to Catholic school. Uh, you know, went to religious ed, uh, went to different youth groups. It was a small suburb of Boston, um, and we had a, a an ex Navy chaplain, Irish priest that was very supportive of just 
keeping kids, you know, involved. And he was very uh, interested in getting us evangelized and then left religious ed to catechize us. And uh, something took root. I think that I was very lucky to have um, a lot of mentors, starting with my parents that were always involved with um, different movements in the church. And uh, so I grew up watching that and kind of, uh, you know, uh, integrating it. Um, and mom and dad made sure that we learned it at home and, uh, and then started to take that on for myself, um, pretty much through college. Um, and then uh, decided to go to grad school for d d more to figure out life. So uh, more the the philosophy undergrad. Oh, yeah, searching theology. for the truth. Exactly. I was yeah, searching. Yeah. You know, I, and just, I was doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I was a philosophy major too. Yeah, yeah. See, and there was something, you know, we had a great, uh, another great mentor was a, a neighbor. Uh, both of them taught it uh, at uh, a Catholic college. And they said, um, you know, if you find something that you like and you find something you're good at, keep going because God has given you those gifts. And don't worry about you know, money and all that stuff will take care of itself. What God will provide if you're, you know, becoming who you are. Mm -hmm. So I got all these echoes. And then when I finally did read John Paul II and in mm -hmm. grad school, the catechism had just come out. Mm -hmm. um, it really just added, you know, teaching to the experiences I had already had. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then both my wife and I uh, were kind of uh, recruited and hired separately uh, around the same time uh, to move from teaching in a Catholic school to working for the diocese. Yeah, that's really great. Now... You're both working for the diocese now. Tell me about what the Office of New Evangelization for Youth and Young Adults is. Great. Well, in, back in 2008, the Cardinal, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, our, our Archbishop in Boston, created this new office, and he brought to an honorable closure the, the former Office for Youth Ministry and the Young Adult Office, and brought them to a closure in order to create a new vision, a new structure, uh, a new way of formation uh, for youth and young adults. If we think about um, the, the state of affairs in, in the life of the church, particularly I'll, I'll just focus on Boston, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of potholes in our faith formation system. I think one of the glaring ones is after a, a young person, a high school teen, if you will, graduates mm -hmm. from confirmation, there's the great drop off into the abyss. And who's there to continue walking with them? Mm -hmm. and, and we can also say, if we look at our sacramental um, index from baptisms, the number of children that come forward from, for baptism versus the, the number of children that come forward for First Communion, then confirmation, and then marriage. We can track this stuff with pretty high accuracy. We know that we're losing them between each sacrament, so they're all falling off. And, and one of the, the great findings in the, in the work that's been done is, is saying that we need to rediscover this idea of accompaniment, of walking with or accompanying our young people and their families along their life's journey as they transition to these different points in their life and different sacramental moments and things like that. So the vision behind the offer and the office and the way it was structured was so that we could be intentionally accompanying our young people, getting the church to think this way or helping the church to better see this in, in providing training, resources, programming that will accompany young people from pre-adolescence through young adult discernment. I think the best analogy for this is the pilgrimage model, where a pilgrimage for us, especially in light of what John Paul II has shown us through World Youth Day, is not just about going to an event, but it's about the journey, just like the road to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. It's the journey that we have with our young people walking with them. And I think of that great quote from, um, from Pope Paul VI and Evangelion Nunciandi, right? That modern man listens more readily to witnesses yeah. than to teachers. And if she listens, if he listens to teachers, it's because they're a witness first. And so that witness earns credibility by the way they live their life and their accompaniment with the young person. Yeah. Well, you know, I know all across the country, there's this unease that very seldom comes explicitly to the surface about why are these kids who are getting confirmed and confirmation is supposed to be the sacrament of strengthening them in their faith and them, them committing themselves to be witnesses for Christ? Why, why do they stop coming to Mass after they get confirmed? Why do they like, think they've done what they're supposed to do as a Catholic? Like they, they, you know, what, like it's a little bit almost like a contradiction to the meaning of the sacrament. And, and, and we're, we're not exactly talking about that. We keep on doing the same thing, and the same thing keeps happening. What, what are your own reflections on what's going on there about why so many young people, after they receive the sacrament of confirmation, rather than are living closer to Christ in the church, drift away? 
That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> the um, and we've been trying to to look at that. And first, I want to say, you know, that um, there have been a lot of good people that are trying to be, you know, parents and catechists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and uh, so when we're looking at models, we're not critiquing them. We're saying that sometimes the models we create start to show wear and tear over time. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't mean change the church or change the theology. It means we need to adapt. As the human person changes, we need to, you know, the church is wonderful at different times and different places around the world, adapting and, and bringing mm -hmm. the gospel to that culture. Mm -hmm. These young people, we've heard of millennials and the different terms, the human person is changing and, and moving. It happened in the Industrial Revolution. It's happening again um, as consumer. Um, some of the documents on the new evangelization talk about the radical individualism, mm -hmm. the emotivism as a mm -hmm. leading you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. decision maker for young people. Um, you take some of these things and you say, okay, how do we, some of our, our classical ways are ineffective because we don't have that that pre-evangelization we don't have that mm -hmm. connection so that part of our job is to turn some of these theories into practical things how do we get kids that are getting confirmed let's look at the system let's break it apart and not be afraid to be a, a research and development office mm -hmm. and try some new things so if i could use the example of pilgrimage that father matt brought up you know so we look at some of these things the the emotivism the individualism, subjectivism. Mm -hmm. Well, if we don't just do pilgrimage as a, as a destination vacation, but we really reconstruct the whole experience of a World Youth Day or the pro-life march, and we look at young people and their leaders, and we reconstruct and say, well, wait a minute, through pilgrimage, we can actually get them, we can teach the objective through their subjective experience that we go through together, through accompaniment. We can uh, take that emotivism and help them process it mm. in this immersion type program. Oh, yeah. So, so you know, what's the actual problem? I think it really is a series of isms that are happening to line up at the same time. But I do think the church has really good remedies. We often say that this is a there's a lot going on, so we need a very complicated medical, uh, you know, um, mm. solution. It's not just one pill anymore. Mm -hmm. It's much more three D, and that's. That's kind of the fun of what we get to do as well as experiment with this. So you're saying you're trying to like lead young people into experiential events after which you could then kind of fill in the blanks a little bit of what you experienced and what it means and how to live it, that, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. So we could say like, like um, service is something that young yeah. people respond to, right? And yeah. they do on the positive, they learn a gift of self. Yeah. But if not processed correctly and yeah. maybe shortcut, they can learn a selfishness that yeah. service is what I do to make me feel good when I don't feel good. Yeah. So what we do is we reconstruct an average service program. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, experimented with a mission trip to the Dominican Republic. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we reconstructed it so we could actually teach these young people the deeper uh, uh, tenets of Catholic social doctrine yeah. and what is human dignity and why are they feeling the way they're feeling. Yeah. And it opens them up. It gets them back on track and you see the faith start to really stick yeah. as they yeah. process it. Great. That sounds really interesting. We're going to take a little break right now. When we come back, I want to ask you more about what concretely you're doing, what you're, what you're finding is working or not working, and then also any advice you have for youth ministers, parents, bishops, priests who are watching, and just, just what, we, what you'd be able to say about how we can kind of reach this, this generation. Okay. Thank you. Each person has dignity and worth, not because of his physical abilities or occupation, not because of her skin color or status. Each person is valuable, not because of his productivity or age, but because we are human, created by God in his own image and likeness. And neither economics nor emotions should alter the length of each person's gift to humanity. Hey, welcome back. We're talking with Father Matt Williams from the Archdiocese of Boston, director of the Office of New Evangelization for Youth and Young Adults, and Stephen Colella, who's the assistant director of the same office. And we're talking about probably one of the most greatest challenges facing the Catholic Church today, how to reach uh, contemporary youth. And uh, you, you said something really interesting. You said basically young people today are more effectively you know, moved you know, by experiences, but you need to use those experiences as a, as a doorway to actually reveal to them what the faith is and who Christ is and what the Christian life is. 
And in some ways, people could say, well, hey, didn't we try this with that catechesis years ago where we kind of did balloons and coloring and we had great experiences, but somehow it never developed into forming disciples. It became more like a human experience. So what's the difference between what, what has been under criticism for not having enough content in it and this kind of experiential model that, that you're talking about? I would say that um, we actually have a very intentional a catechesis, uh, a theology, the material, the teaching of the church that we intend to deliver. And you deliver different pieces through the different experiences. Um, an example we often use that we're seeing success with is, is we call it a coaching model. So um, we're from the Boston area. We're proud of our sports teams. Um, but you need to have a good coach, the head coach. You need to have a coaching staff. You need to have players. And the interesting thing about sports, when you create a system, is that you're intentionally coaching to the player and their strengths and the areas they need to grow in, but you're doing it through a system so that you know what the end result is. So you're not just letting them develop as their own player. In the long term, that doesn't help the players or the team. As the coach, you pass on to the assistant coaches, you know, the offense, the defense, what, what the higher level system is. And then through the individual, you give them certain drills for certain positions or certain players. Um, we're using that from a faith formation point of view. So unlike maybe some of the experiments tried in the past, we take a very strong you know, section from the catechism or from a church, the church teaching and lay that out and use that model to pass it down. And then depending on the experience they're having and what they're expressing, the different coaches can be able to coach to get them to understand. So some people, you know, the old model, sometimes it, some are attracted to truth, some goodness, some beauty, and some the unity of the church's teachings. Yeah. I think you could say it's very much like a spiritual direction model. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and re rever reverencing where that person is at on their journey, understanding their culture, their mindset, where they're mm -hmm. coming from, in order to effectively help them to receive what is what is being proposed to them and to embrace it, and that there for there to be greater fruit in their life. Uh, as a follower of Christ. How do you get people who are able to do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part of rebuilding the system, uh -huh. you know, so it's, it, this is, we're in year, well, I guess it's five, year five now for, my gosh, time goes by so quickly, you know, but there's certainly a lot of uh, wonderful um, leaders and we call them animators, you know, uh -huh. animators are, yeah. are people who are, you know, living witnesses of the gospel, love the church and want to share that faith, you know, mm -hmm. and what we're seeing now in, in our experience is as we, we get get some momentum and stuff like that is that the young people that have gone through our programs are emerging as our leaders mm -hmm. so essentially we're creating a farm team if you will so it'll start out slow the farm team starts out slow mm -hmm. but it'll it'll get momentum and then these these young people will in turn be our leaders and our animators mm -hmm. um, as we go forward are you working with particular parishes or are you working with like a central program that's open to youth throughout the archdiocese or like who are you actually working with right now Right now, it, we're both direct. Our service to young people is both direct and indirect. Mm -hmm. So the programs that we do offer tend to be programs that a parish would not be able to do on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, one a glaring example would be a CYL basketball league or harbor cruises and things like that. Mm -hmm. Other things, which um, which are more outreach events, and the, the you have to have you need to have a a whole um, system by which you're if you will, the, a pig and getting the kids that have yeah. no, uh, and get them along, yeah. get them, yeah. get them into the system yeah, so right. that you can evangelize them and catechize them, disciple them for them, and then yeah. so send so them out so to some mission. Some kids who would play on a CYO sports team wouldn't go anywhere near a retreat. Exactly. And, and some people who wouldn't play on a sports team or a retreat would be attracted by a harbor cruise. And so you use all these as entry ways or exactly. like pre-evangelization exactly. a little bit. Like exactly. That. And then like going to Washington, D.C. for on a pilgrimage, yeah. you know. So now that, which is much more evangelization yeah. and, and catechesis thing. There, but providing, I mean, we, we run a rally with our cardinal, you know, so wouldn't a parish wouldn't be able to do that on their own. Yeah. And then I would say the, a lot of the leadership, there's certainly mm -hmm. other things too, but the leadership um, curriculum that we've created is something that um, it would take a long time for a parish to create their own. But yeah. we, you know, this is the gift that we're able to offer. So parishes are able to send their young people yeah. or accompany them yeah. to, for an experience like this. Yeah. Great. And, and I would also say we get to train some of the leaders through those youth experiences so that they can become animators. Yeah. Um, and then we also have, we run a, a lot of leadership training opportunities for adults. Yes. And uh, what we're finding is what Pope Benedict said, that we look and try and identify the seeker 
that's already in their vocation, already, you know, it could be a mom that wants mm-hmm. to, you know, look after their junior high kid transitioning to high school. Yeah. It could be um, a grandparent, a grandfather that says, look, I'm, I'm willing, help me. What do I do for these young people? You yeah. know, I, I see value in them. Yeah. And, and um, so we run these trainings, uh, skills for evangelization. Some of it's skills based. We run a basic skill, which is a little more theology and framing the, the generational dynamics mm-hmm. um, so that everyone can go back with a tool belt. And in their particular, where God's placed them, they can start doing that. Yeah. Now, this is going to be a hard question, I know, but for people who don't live in the Archdiocese of Boston, for people who can't connect with what you're doing, what what, what could you say to parents who are concerned about what's happening to their kids or grandparents or people who made their kids get confirmed but now can't make them go to church anymore? You know, like what, 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 what could you, what kind of, could you say to them? (laughs) <laughs> this is the age old question. I don't know if you have any thoughts off the top. You... Def- definitely. We live in a time where, uh, we're told not to talk about, you know, religion. And I would say just the opposite. And of course, pray for them, you know, but I have to say what sometimes what the gut reaction is, is wrong. Well, let them rediscover it. They'll come back. That's not happening statistically anymore. So it's a different generation. So I would say just the opposite. If you're a parent, not only show them why you believe, talk about it at the dinner table. Right. You know, um, I think it was Cardinal Lorenzo said, start bringing the catechism and crack open a paragraph, you know, after dinner. Like, this is who we are. Mm-hmm. And we've spent so long, you know, trying to get along with the world to show them how we're like everyone else. We're in a new era. Mm-hmm. We have to show them how we're different and that those yeah. differences have a lot of strengths to offer our culture. Yeah. If you're a grandparent, you have a unique role mm-hmm. to just, you can... You can, your grandchildren are going to love you because you've spoiled them no matter what. Dump it on them. Dump it on them. Do you know what I mean? Just, you know, the gut reaction is not to, not to bother. It's just the opposite. Do anything you can. It could be your kids. It could be the role in your neighborhood. Yeah, that's right. You go out of your way to to say hi to those and, and intentionally, you know, say, Hey, this is who we are. And, you know, Mm -hmm. didn't you go to church? And, you know, it's not okay to be doing this, this, and this. That's not who we are. Yeah. You know, and again, the tone is very, you know, kind and loving, but it's got to be truthful. I would say you become a saint. So like you have to strive to become a saint because you saints beget saints. You know what I mean? Or, or mm. people become saints around saints. So it's our own call to holiness and our own um, ch- challenging ourselves to go deeper and our call to holiness and what the Lord's calling me to do. Secondly, I would pray for people to come into the, my child's life to cross parent in some capacity. Mm-hmm. Someone to come in and to back up everything that I've been saying. Did Lord send someone? Because we know that the prophet's not without except in the native place. So. Lord, that you will send somebody into my son or daughter's life that will say exactly what I'm saying, but hit it from a different angle that my child can hear. And the last thing is, is that I really do believe in the family rosary. The family that prays together stays together. Mm. Institute the family rosary. Pray. My parents did that, and my sister and I were not into the rosary on, but we kind of prayed in some ways out of guilt, if you will, but we did it. That planted seeds. And that, that time of praying the rosary together became an opportunity for the family to bond together. So family rosary, I'm a big proponent of. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that, that, that's really good advice because, like, like you said, there's a gap opening up between our culture and, and the church. And we need to start explaining to people the gap because used to, we used to presume that the values of the church were supported in, in the values of society, but that's no longer the case. And we need to kind of like help our children wake up to the fact that, look, the ships are diverging. You know, this way is confusion and, and misery and frustration and rebellion. And, and this way is, is a good life. You know, this way is healthy marriages and healthy people right. and this type of thing. So I thought that was really a good thing. We need to start explaining to our children, there's a choice coming and this way lies death and this way lies, lies life. And I think our Holy Fathers always remind us of who we are, mm-hmm. who God is, and really what makes us happy. Does this yeah. choice really, is this the loving choice? Yeah. Does this choice really lead to happiness? Yeah. Getting them to ponder a little bit, why, what's the significance and the implications of the decisions I make? Great. Well, we want to actually help people to respond to what we're talking about. So I've written a little booklet called The New Evangelization, Why Bother? And we're going to tell people how they can get it and more about it. And when we come back, we're just going to have a few minutes left. I'm going to ask each of us to maybe have a few parting words for, for the folks who are with us today. Thank you. There's a lot of talk in the church today about the new evangelization. What exactly is it? And what does it have to do with the ordinary Catholic? Even more fundamentally, why bother? Does it really make any difference if people believe in Christ or not? 
Does it really make any difference if people become joined to the church or not? Isn't almost everybody going to be saved even if they don't know Christ through the church? In this booklet, I answer these and other questions about this all important topic. Because of the generosity of our donors, we'd like to make this booklet available to you at no cost, just for the asking. Go to our website at renewalministries.net and click on free booklet or call 1-800-282-4789. You'll really find some answers that are relevant to you. Well, you know, I, I know you're not ready to export this over the whole country. You got your hands full in, our, in Boston, but how can people get in contact with your website? What's your website address? Great. It is www.14boston.org. O-N-E, the number four, boston.org. And we try to put up things we're doing as well as resources. We hope to load up oh, more and more for, the, Good, for using great. new media. Stephen, do you have any final words of advice or encouragement to, to folks who are with us today? Yeah, um, I would say that uh, live your faith to the fullest, um, that our young people are such a treasure, but it starts with your witness. So know your faith more, live it to the fullest, and, and fear not. Um, don't be afraid to talk to people about uh, your faith and the gifts we have. That's great. Brother Matt. You know, uh, Dr. Peter Kreef just wrote an article, uh, The Winning Strategy, and it's a wonderful, wonderful article in which he says, we are at war. And we have to know who our enemy is and we need a winning strategy. And we know that first and foremost, our enemy are the evil one, Satan and his fallen uh, demons, but also sin, that I can be a cause of evil, if you will, when I cooperate with sin or if I were to cooperate with temptation. And that we need saints, and this is the winning strategy, to combat the culture of death that we live in. We are in a crisis of saints in the life of our church, and the Lord is calling you to become a saint. He's calling us all to reach our fullest potential in Christ and our call to holiness. The world needs saints. And so I would just strongly encourage everyone to take serious their call to conversion, their call to become a saint as the Lord has, has created us to be so that we may be living witnesses and help to others to know the power of Jesus' love and immerse his mercy, his joy, and not to be afraid to share that with young people. And I just ask the Lord, Lord Jesus, I ask you to bless all those who are tuning in today, and I ask you, Lord, that they would come to know the power of your love and mercy, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and be able to respond anew to the graces in their lives, so they can bring forth Jesus Christ into the world through the intercession of our Blessed Mother Mary. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hey, thank you so much, Father Matthew. That, that's really great. We appreciate the prayer and the blessing. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for what you're doing. May the Lord bless you and strengthen you as you go on to love and serve the Lord and his people. Hey, next week, same time, same place, the choices we face. 